The program was all complete, except we had one, somebody couldn't come, and there was one blank space. And it, sort of at the last minute, I got a, an email that said, I know it's late, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Is there any possibility? And what he had said that he had to, I said, well, send me an abstract. And he did, and he was, he's addressing the right of the victim, or the right of the researchee in research that's done when adults are being researched, uh, when people are doing research of adults about, the, uh, about circumcision, and what, what was the right of that, that researchee. And uh, this is something we've all known about the African studies. We have American researchers going to Africa to do these studies that we knew, we knew that the, first of all, that the researchers were all, already advocating circumcision. They went to another country, and a man from Kenya said to me, they've come here to, to do research, research here that we know was not valid, and we are the victims. This is racism. Anyway, this, so we, we now have a man, Michael Drash, a uh, newcomer to the movement for, that we know, but he's going to address that. About time, huh? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, oops, hold on. Um, we're all over the place here. Um, so yeah, my name is Michael Drash. Um, thanks for having me here. Everyone's talking about it be feeling like family. This is a bit like the Oscars for me. Um, <laughs> so from the beginning. All right, um, so yeah, let's just get into it. I apologize if we don't have time for questions, but let's just go for it. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, good afternoon and thanks for having me. Um, it's nice to be among you know people who are. It doesn't feel like I'm shouting into the wind. Um, so I guess this afternoon, as, as Marilyn introduced me, I'll be talking about evaluating the rights of human research subjects in randomized uh, circumcision trials. Um, so as we sort of we mostly focus um, in the movement on on the rights of children vis-a-vis -vis their par their parents and their communities and sort of. Um, protecting people on that avenue, but they're not the only people who have um, a right to general autonomy. Obviously, all adults do as well, and a particularly vulnerable population are those in, um, in randomized uh, trials. Um, so we know that, that often the medical claims come up often, um, and I don't really want to get into the details of it, because I've been mean, following Brian's um, talk yesterday. It, it, getting lost in the weeds is a little bit beside the point when the, like the, the psychosocial like, obligation of, of research ethics is concerned. Um, but I do want to draw a distinction between clinical and observational studies. So observational studies are those which um, there's no actual intervention, we're just, you're just observing a situation that already exists. So any circumcision in, in this kind of study wouldn't have been conducted by the researchers, whereas in a clinical study, the researchers are the ones responsible for the circumcision and, and for that state, uh, state change. Um, so I just pulled a quick definition from the PubMed Health Glossary, glossary here for, for clinical studies. A study in which the participants are divided by chance into separate groups that compare different treatments or other interventions. Uh, using chance to divide people into groups means that the groups will be similar and that the effects of treatment of the treatments they receive can be compared more fairly. At the time of the trial, it is not known which treatment is best. Um, so before we go too far into the details, I just want to put up one um, guiding guideline from the World Medical um, Association Declaration of Helsinki on, on ethical principles um, for research subjects, which will be one of the main frameworks I work with uh, today. Um, and we don't have time to go into all the fundamentals of research ethics, but this is an important one to keep in mind, that while the primary purpose of medical research is to generate new knowledge, uh, this goal can never take precedence over the rights and interests of individual patients. Um, so what, are we, what am I actually going to be talking about today, if not the, the specifics of medical, um, of the of medical side of circumcision? So the two frameworks I'll be working with will be, one will be the Nuremberg Code, and one will be the Declaration of Helsinki, but from the World Medical Association. And then I'll briefly introduce, um, probably not introduce, but just summarize again, um, the African studies that everyone's fairly familiar with, and then evaluate them within that context. Um, and there'll be three questions I'll be, I'll be sort of asking along the way. Um, first is whether there was proper scientific justification for these studies to have ever been performed in the beginning. Um, and then secondly, uh, the, whether informed consent was really gotten. And, and this has been um, talked about before, so I'll try to speed through those two. Um, because ever, a lot of people will be familiar, uh, George Hill, who I'm, I'm very sad to, well, isn't here, um, has written a great paper with uh, Gregory Boyle on the subject in 2011. That, that is one of my favorites on the topic. Um, so I'll be quoting heavily from that. But then the third question is, is sort of my own. It's, it's whether or not 
amputation is ever experimentally appropriate, whether or not like the removal, the, the permanent removal of anything is experimentally appropriate, particularly in, in this situation. Um, so the two we'll be talking about, like I said, is the Nuremberg Code and the Declaration of Helsinki. They have two distinct purposes. So the Nuremberg Code um, was, it came out of, out of World War II um, in the doctor's trials in Nuremberg. Um, it's somewhat outdated. It's based in the 1931 German um, Code of Research Ethics. And it's, it's however, very widely known among, the, among lay people and has a lot of sort of rhetorical weight to it that um, more updated codes really lack. Um, whereas the World Medical Association Declar of Hels Declaration of Helsinki is, is sort of the opposite. It's less known outside of niche circles, um, but it is widely um, respected within its own field, updated regularly, most recently in 2013. Um, and so that, that's the purpose of the t dual uh, comparison here. Um, so the three studies we'll be talking about, obviously, are Overt et al. 2005, um, Bailey et al. 2007, and Gray et al. 2007 as well, um, respectively in uh, South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda. Um, so these, there's also a fourth one, um, but the commonality among those three is they were studying um, female in stereodiscordant uh, relationships, so, so HIV positive women transmission to HIV negative men. There's also a fourth study, Wauer et al., that is the opposite, so HIV positive men to HIV positive women. It's distinct enough methodologically that I'm just going to treat the first three together and kind of ignore the fourth one, though my criticisms do um, map on properly. Um, so the commonalities are, are that they were all randomized uh, clinical trials. Um, there was testing to see if, if, if uh, circumcision reduces HIV infection rates over the period that was observed. Um, but somewhat implicitly, if you're, you're the, the hypothesis is that it's a lifelong benefit that's, that's um, incurred from the intervention. Um, so subjects were recruited from the local population in those three countries in, in different provinces. Um, and there was a two-year observation period, and initially they were split into the two groups. Um, the first was circumcised at the beginning of the study, the second at the end, um, and, and those were sort of, that's sort of the general scope of it. Many of you are probably more familiar with them than I am. Um, so to move on to the first question is sort of of scientific appropriateness. Um, were the studies sufficiently justified? And this is sort of um, something I don't really want to get too into the weeds about again, because risk is going to be very subjective. It's obviously very relevant. It's, it makes up the quite a large portion of both the World Medical Association guidelines and the, uh, the uh, Nuremberg Code, but it's going to be inherently suggestive, so, uh, excuse me, uh, subjective. Um, so let's just go through some of the, the quotations, right? So the Declaration of Helsinki, the 16th uh, dec um, paragraph, and a note on the ordering here, the Declaration of Helsinki is very explicit that each of the paragraphs has equal weight and the ordering is somewhat irrelevant for them. Um, so, uh, paragraph 16, in medical practice and in medical research, most interventions involve risks and burdens. It's sort of an obvious thing. Um, so that's sort of roadblock number one to really get into the weeds of this. You can, you can have legitimate discussions over what is, is a proper risk-harm analysis. Um, furthermore, 18, physicians may be involved in a research study involving hu uh, human subjects, or excuse me, may not be involved unless they are confident that the risks have been adequately assessed and can be satisfactorily managed. Uh, when the risks are found to outweigh the potential benefits or when there is conclusive proof of definitive outcomes, uh, phys physicians must assess whether to continue, modify, or immediately stop the study. So we have, it seems, um, throughout the course of these presentations, a rather large um, disagreement over whether or not the loss of the force can counts as um, an adequate risk that would count as this, right? So we're going to sort of have a lost in translation discussion that's not going to be fruitful outside of, of and I'm also not going to convince anyone who's already here um, about this. So I don't think it's, it's really worth too much time, but it is worth pointing out where these textual um, assertions come from. And then so the same thing about the AIDS crisis, right? Like that's one of the main reasons that this, these research w uh, studies were done in Africa is because these are, these are uh, ground zero for the AIDS epidemic. Again, relevant, but also not in terms of the actual like, research ethic component of it, in part because, um, as the Nuremberg uh, Code points out, the degree of risk uh, to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance of the problem to be solved by the experiment. So that like, idea of humanitarian importance is going to be subjective and isn't really a useful metric by which to um, necessarily come down as, as an, find a, an objective point that you can disagree with, in my opinion. Um, also further from the uh, Nuremberg Code, the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results for the good of society, unprocurable by other methods or means of study. So we do have those options of observational studies. They have often come back ambiguous with the, the body of the literature is somewhat 
Uh, you can point to studies, as you know, that, that show that it has a benefit, that it has no benefit, that it has negative benefit in terms of preventing HIV. Um, and, and that's sort of the problem, is that it's not really procurable definitively through observational studies. And that sort of puts researchers in a position where they feel like they're going to have to do clinical trials on adults who are sensibly consenting. Um, again, this is sort of, sort of furthered by um, the experiment should be designed and based on the results of animal experimentation and knowledge of the natural history of the disease. And this is where I think these three studies start to actually falter and become truly uh, objectively criticizable um, in terms of, of their knowledge and description of the natural history of the disease, the sort of like how the disease works and what's actually going on um, or, or other problem under study. And that the anticipated results will justify the performance of the, experience, uh, the experiment. Um, the more updated version from the Declaration of Helsinki, paragraph 21, is that medical research involving human subjects must conform to generally accepted scientific principles, um, be based on a thorough knowledge of the scientific literature, so that's sort of that same thread popping up again in the modern version, um, other relevant sources of information and adequate laboratory and, as appropriate, animal experimentation. Um, the welfare animals used for research must be respected. Um, so we can kind of pull out of this um, a sort of unified thread, if I will, uh, uh, defined as um, a requirement that the research must be based in thorough knowledge of the research and literature before experimentation. Um, so to evaluate the three studies, luckily Boyle and Hill already did this for me. Um, so there's, here's, there's a very, very lopsided set of citations. Um, as you can see, there's very little cited uh, in terms of, in, in terms of the literature review before conducting the studies, the anti-male circumcision line there is, is very sparse. Um, in fact, it doesn't exist in the Ugandan studies. Um, and I'll just read briefly from Boyle and Hill. Uh, a, motion, a mission of contradictory evidence prevented a more balanced consideration of the issues that the trials lacked equipoise from the outset. And I will say that they're talking about this in terms of methodological concerns. They did not raise this as one of their um, ethical concerns with these studies. They did, they did raise um, issues of informed consent, but this is, this is not um, where they were pointing it out. Um, in the South African report, two anti-male circumcision references were miscited. So this is the two. Uh, oops, can you hear, um, in Overa et al, these two here, and then the one under Bailey. Um, so to read, oops, so I've gone backwards, here we go. Um, in the South African report, two anti-male circumcision references were miscited either as neutral or pro-circumcision, so that 25 out of 34, 20, 74 percent of, of the references were cited in support of male circumcision. In the Kenyan report, only one anti-male circumcision reference was cited, but incorrectly, as being a neutral reference. In, the Ugand in both Ugandan reports, no references opposing male circumcision were cited. In none of the reports was even a single reference cited opposing male circumcision in contrast to the more than 70% of citations supporting male circumcision. Uh, not acknowledging the, public evident, uh, the published evidence showing no prof prophylactic benefit of male circumcision is problematic. And again, when they say problematic here, they mean methodologically. I'm saying it's not just, me just methodological, but also ethical in terms of the duty and obligation to the research subjects that the studies they're being subjected to are scientifically valid. Um, so that's that point. All right, so though we know the, the authors were perhaps not as informed as they could be, but let's concede to them that they were in, as informed as they might have been because it's just easier to streamline the discussion towards the end question. Um, right. the, the informed consent, again, we, we, this sort of pops up again with the, the, the subjects. Were they properly informed of what was going on? And I think it's, again, in the, in the interest of efficiency, we're just going to give them the researchers the benefit of the doubt that they just passed on their uh, perhaps imperfect understanding directly to the, to the subjects. Um, but there's a further tertiary consideration, um, but I will just point through the text again. Um, although the Nuremberg Code can be somewhat vague, so at times it's, it's really blunt here. The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Um, even in 1945, this was number one on the list, and the, and the Nuremberg Code is in fact ordered um, and number one on the list and very, very, very clear. Um, the modern version is, is a little bit more um, verbose, but it's saying the same thing. So in medical research involving human subjects capable of giving informed consent, each potential subject must be adequately informed of the aims, methods, sources of funding, any possible conflicts of interest, institutional affiliations of the researcher, the anticipated benefits and potential risks of the study, and the discomfort in, comfort it may entail, post-study provisions, and any other relevant aspects of the study, and then it goes on. Um, to talk about the right to refuse and the right to withdraw, which I'll get to in a second, but just flagging that right to withdraw as being important. Um, so not only are they worried about that sort of being informed about the aims and purpose of the study, there's also um, another paragraph 
and, and again, we've hypothetically conceded that they were informed, which I don't think they were, and I think Boyle and Hill make the argument much better than I can right now. But assuming that they were, there's another tertiary consideration in terms of informed consent, and that's to do with vulnerable groups. Um, so medical research with a vulnerable, vulnerable group is only justified if the research is responsive to the health needs or priorities of this group, and, not or, and, the research cannot be carried out in a non-vulnerable group. In addition, this group should stand to benefit from the knowledge, practices, or interventions that result from the research. So it's a bit of a, tru a, a truism that groups uh, struggling under HIV, like high HIV rates are going to generally be uh, also victims of, of extreme poverty and unable to, um, they're going to have that sort of attendant vulnerability. Um, patients were, uh, the subjects here were, were given money, um, health care, which is expensive and, in, and also relatively rare in some of the more rural parts of the, uh, where these studies were conducted, um, which is itself a problem. But there's also this sort of the second caveat that the research cannot be carried out in a non-vulnerable group. Um, and so I can think of off the top of my head, or when I first read this, off the top of my head, two groups. So number one, American Latino populations are relatively uncircumcised relative to the um, general American population and also um, have higher HIV rates. So that would be the perfect test group for this study. And sort of the question is, why wasn't this study conducted in that group? So that's group number one. Number two is post-Soviet states where there are soaring HIV rates and low levels of circumcision. Again, why are these, and, and also concurrent to that, public health apparatuses that can monitor and govern research and researchers to prevent exploitation. That is not necessarily going to be true in generally impoverished, like, uh, the third, uh, third world countries, it's sort of an outdated term, we'll get to the more updated term from uh, a European Union funded group. Um, this is, I think, ethics dumping. It's, it's, it's sort of a term that we'll define here from a book about ethics dumping. Um, it occurs mainly in two areas. First, when research participants and or resources in low and middle income countries, LMICs, are exploited intentionally, for instance, because research can be undertaken in, L in an LMIC that would be prohibited in a high income country. Second, exploitation can occur due, in, due to insufficient ethics awareness on the part of the researcher or low research governance capacity in the host nation. I think this is precisely why these studies were conducted in Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa, and not in the American Latino populations or in Moscow or anywhere else in the post-Soviet sphere. Um, they, I really think that that's sort of one major crux of this issue, and that's sort of speaking to what Marilyn was saying, the, the man who was, who was talking to her. That's, that's what it feels like, and that's what it looks like from the outside as well. Um, which then brings us to the next question of whether, even if it was done in America, would it have been allowable? And I think the answer is no on the grounds of the permanence of the, of the amputation. Um, are amputative interventions too permanently, permanent to be ethically valid? Um, this is sort of the main question that I don't think I've actually seen a whole lot of literature on um, in really any field. Um, so first, let's just look through the text again, as we've been doing. Uh, from the Nuremberg Code, Number, uh, paragraph nine, during the course of the experiment, the human subject should be at liberty to bring the experiment to an end if he has reached, or she or they, this was 1945, um, has reached the physical or mental state where continuation of the experiment seems to him to be impossible. And in fact, this is so important to them, they said it twice from two different angles. Paragraph 10, during the course of the experiment, the scientist in charge must be prepared to terminate the experiment at any, at any stage if he has probable cause to believe in the exercise of, good, of the good faith, superior skill, and careful judgment required by him that a continuation of the experiment is likely to result in injury, disability, or death to the experimental subject. So setting aside the fact that the conception of foreskin removal as an injury or harm or sexual disability, ignoring that sort of conceptual disagreement we might have with the researchers entirely, you can't undo a circumcision in this context, right? Once the, the experiment has begun, it cannot end. The observation can end, but that's ultimately one could argue, and I am arguing, not the main part of the study. The study was a circumcision study, not an observation, observational study. It was a clinical study. Um, so to, to jump forward in time to the 2013 version of this paragraph, uh, the second half of the informed consent paragraph from the uh, Declaration of Helsinki. Um, the potential subject must be informed of the right to refuse to participate in the study or to withdraw consent to participate at any time without reprisal. Special attention should be given to the specific information needs of individual potential subjects, uh, subjects as well as to the methods used to deliver the information. Um, circumcision is a static change in, on the part of the, of the subject, right? It's an either or, it's a yes, no, there's no ability to withdraw from a circumcision 
post circumcision. That, that's really the question here. Um, and there's no real uh, precedent for how to ana analyze this, in part because um, it's just so rare that anyone would, would try to do surgery as a public health method. In fact, the, the authors of the studies are, are, are um, particularly aware of that. Um, in fact, Gray et al. in their uh, write-up say, the use of surgery for disease prevention is an unusual public health intervention. Um, one precedent is the mass sterilization camps in India during the 1970s, which were poorly Im implemented and resulted in serious surgical complications, deaths, and ultimately the collapse of the programs. Um, that sort of undersells the coercion that went on in this period and, and is, I think, relatively comparable to the coercion that's occurring in some, in some parts of Africa now. Um, as a result of these, these particular studies, they knew what would happen from these studies and, and referenced an example of how it happened and still did it anyway. Um, thus, future provision of circumcision for HIV prevention must maintain the highest achievable levels of safety uh, to be acceptable and, and, and sustainable. Um, so that's as far as they were concerned with the issue. Um, you can kind of go outside of the therapeutic angle, and there's an, there's an interesting um, disorder whereby people believe their, or patients will believe that their, their own limbs are not their own, and will conceive of their, their limbs as diseased and not theirs and want to have a part of themselves amputated. And interestingly here, the discussion revolves around whether or not that therapeutic removal of a limb is ethical, right? Like it's sort of the inverse, right? Can we amputate something that the patient wants amputated? Um, and so some will argue that um, you can. And I think I do have enough time, but I want to leave some time for questions. So I won't read all of it. But they do say it might be obscene, it might seem obscene to legitimize the desire for the amputation of healthy limbs. Um, but to jump to the last sentence, but the fact that they are inaccessible, um, that is the third person perspective of, of why one will want to have an amputation, should not lead us to dismiss the suffering they might cause. Uh, whether amputation is an appropriate response to the suffering is a difficult question, but we believe that in some cases it might be. So that's these two researchers who give us this sort of window that maybe um, the removal of a limb can be helpful if the people want it, and we should ignore the ethical obligation not to harm in order to do that. Um, on, the, on the converse side of this, we have another ethicist who, who argues that, to summarize, I have argued that, um, and these are both really interesting papers in their totality. Um, to summarize, I have argued that while wannabes, people who want to have their limbs amputated, um, may well be autonomous agents capable of autonomous decision making, they are nonetheless bound to lack a certain kind of knowledge necessary to consent to voluntary amputation. So he's talking about people who, irrespective of any kind of coercion, they're not part of any kind of study, they're not part of anything at all, they want to have their limbs amputated, he's arguing that they lack a certain kind of knowledge necessary to consent. Um, so if the ethical permissibility of voluntary amputation turns on whether or not voluntary amputation is reasonable and proper medical treatment performed with the patient's consent, then proponents of voluntary amputation as therapy for wannabes, people who want to have their, their limbs amputated, have not yet made their case. Worse, it is a possible for an auto if it is possible for an autonomous agent to identify with her desire for amputation, but lack something necessary for consent, it is unclear that any argument for autonomy is going to be successful. And remember, this is for people who have no coercive other than their own sort of mental, potentially, disorder. They cannot, cons he's arguing they cannot consent to an amputation ever outside of the framework of an, of an experimental study. And then if you add on the ethical obligations of a researcher on top of this general ethical quandary, it seems to me that it is, in every instance, always going to be impossible to ethically remove or amputate any part of the human body in a clinical study without like a, therape a therapeutic angle to that study. Um, thank you. Yeah.